Hello, my name is Sasha Baron Cohen. And I'm Aaron Sorkin. And this is Notes on a Scene for the Trial of the Chicago 7. Do you know why you're on trial here? We carried certain ideas across state lines. Not machine guns or drugs or little girls, ideas. I first heard about the trial of the Chicago 7 when I was a student at the age of 20, and I came across this incredible character, Abby Hoffman, cut to 13 years ago, and I hear that Steven Spielberg is making a movie about the trial, and it's written by the very brilliant Aaron Sorkin. Cheekily, I call up Steven Spielberg, introduce myself. I'd just done a movie called Borat. I said, I want to audition. It was after, I think, my first or second draft of what would end up being 32 that Sasha was cast. Aaron had written the screenplay and unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, including the tragic death of two of the cast members, the movie ended up not happening at that time. Heath Ledger and Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, had both been cast originally. Stephen became the producer. He wanted someone else to direct it. It went through the hands of a number of directors. Over a decade uh, went by. Donald Trump was elected and Stephen thought the time to make this movie was now. By then I had directed for the first time. I directed Molly's Game and Stephen thought I should direct Chicago 7. Sasha found out that the movie was happening, got in touch with me and let me know that the part was still his. He hadn't given it up. I was thrilled. I jumped for joy. When we crossed from New York to New Jersey to Pennsylvania to Ohio to Illinois, we had certain ideas. And for that, we were gassed, beaten, arrested, and put on trial. This is the moment where Abby takes the stand. He is chosen out of the Chicago Seven, or eight, including Bobby Seale, to be the representative of the group. And it's incredibly surprising because he is seen as a clown, as a fool as a prankster, but over the course of the trial, they realize he may well be the smartest man in the room. The most important thing about every element of this scene was simplicity. Finally, after all the fireworks uh, of the film, it needed to be very simple with the least simple of the Chicago 7. We had a discussion early on with the costume department where I said I'd really like to wear some of the outfits that Abby chose because he actually chose, he was very purposeful and very aware of the camera. This is one of the more simple ones. And then there's the hair. The hair, I felt that there was a specific choice with Abby. It's something that I read in his autobiography where he actually grew his hair to that length for political reasons. He knew that he could get, you know, what were referred to as hippies to join the movement in droves if he looked like them. I let all the actors know they were not required to do a physical or vocal impersonation uh, of the people that they were playing. The one exception was going to be Abby, who has an iconic look. He has an iconic dialect. It's, it's not quite a Boston accent. It's not quite a Brooklyn accent. It's an Abby Hoffman uh, uh, dialect. I really wanted to be able, to, in order to inhabit Abby, to really master the accent. And so I was lucky enough to work with the greatest dialect coach in history, Tim Monick. And we basically compiled a list of audio recordings of Abby to listen to how his voice changed. In between setups, really, I was really just listening to various speeches that were nothing to do with this by Abby Hoffman to get the rhythm, kind of feel him, you know, feel the, the vibe of Abby Hoffman. My recollection was that you had earbuds in right until the moment, you, you know, you started hearing, you know, okay, cameras up, sound speed, speeding. It was interesting, that shot beforehand, we did a, a number of different camera setups. I did one version where I'm looking that way, the jury are over here. So I did a bunch of takes where I was looking that way, where I'm looking at Rylance, or here is Jerry Rubin and the rest of Chicago 7. Then when I'm looking at here, we're looking at Frank Langella. We didn't have much time to make this. And so I felt part of my job was to give Aaron options in the edit. Ordinarily, take after take, the director is sitting next to the script supervisor. And you'll say, circle that one, or it's takes two, five, and six. 
those are the ones that you want the editor to work with. When we got done shooting this scene, I just said, circle the whole thing. In 1861, Lincoln said in his inaugural address, when the people shall grow weary of their constitutional right to amend their government, they shall exert their revolutionary right to dismember and overthrow that government. And if Lincoln had given that speech in Lincoln Park last summer, he'd be put on trial with the rest of us. That's a brilliant bit of writing by Aaron there, fantastic. They're accused of being unpatriotic, and he basically makes clear that Lincoln himself would be put in jail for doing what they did. I hate saying this after Sasha just gave me uh, such a nice compliment. I can really only take credit for being a good editor. Everything that Abby says on the, st on the stand, it it's not stuff that he said on the stand. It's stuff that he said that I turned into testimony. So how do you overthrow or dismember, as you say, your government peacefully? In this country, we do it every four years. Wait a minute, that's, is that your line, Aaron? That's me. That's a great line. And now Baron we're getting into me. That's all. That little pan going from Mark Rylance over Joe Gordon Levitt is actually simpler than a cut. I'm going to draw a, a pan. That's a bit difficult. Here, we have moved that way. We have here Joseph Gordon Levitt. Mark Rylance is heading over there. And these are the extras who were actually incredible. I've got to say, they loved the movie, they loved listening to it. And it w they sometimes reacted, you'd do a take and they would. You'd see whether it was good or not afterwards. They, for Sasha, erupted into applause time and time again. It was really, it was something. By the way, these are props. <laughs> this table is a visual effect. <laughs> that one. Yeah, that table wasn't really there. We had the Star Wars visual effects team create that one. This one was real. But this leg, this leg is created and taken from Lincoln. So Chicago was just a massive voter registration drive. Yeah. The light's beautiful. Faden Papa Michael, our DP, 50, 60% of the film, we're, we're in that courtroom. Faden Papa Michael found ways to change the lighting conditions depending on what time of day it was, depending on that the trial went from September to February. One of the pieces of advice that Stephen uh, gave me was make sure there are windows in the courtroom because he knew we were going to need to change lighting conditions. The other thing was I wanted the courtroom to feel big, cavernous and oppressive. So you really felt, you know, the weight of the government coming down on these guys. I wanted to have a certain sound to it, a kind of cathedral uh, sound. And if we're saying the whole world is watching, it should feel like the whole world is watching. There, there, there should be a hundred people out there. Shane Valentino, our production designer, built us this courtroom inside of an abandoned church in Patterson, New Jersey. Did you hear the tape we played in court of Tom Hayden at the band show? Yes. You heard the tape? Yes. And did you hear Mr. Hayden give an instruction to his people to take to the streets? His people? Hayden's not a mafia daughter, neither am I. Did you hear him say, if blood is gonna flow, let it flow all over the city? <laughs> we haven't talked about Frank Langella, who's obviously there, who was wonderful an incredible support throughout this scene. We did the first take and he took me aside and he said, this is beautiful. I mean, Frank Langello basically, you know, t helped teach me how to act between the camera setups. It was a Frank Langello school of actor. At our first meeting, he, he had said, uh, listen, would it be okay with you uh, if I didn't joke around with the others, if I came to the set a, a minute later, if I came in through a different door, he wanted them to experience him only as this judge, this 80-year-old, incredibly famous actor uh, uh, coming in to scare them to death. And at the end of the first day, he waved me over and said, those good guys look like they're having a really good time over there. Remember what I said? Forget it. <laughs> no, he still scared the hell out of all of us. The beginning of that sentence was supposed to be... The... Yes, yes, I did. Here in this scene, I know when Schultz comes, brilliantly played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, that this is the boxing match now. We're similar ages and we're, we're representing almost two sides of America, him the establishment and me the anti-establishment. I say me, I mean Abby. What'd you think of that? 
I think Tom Hayden is a badass of an American patriot. Abby has just said, I think Tom Hayden is a badass of an American patriot. It's the first nice thing he has said about and to Tom Hayden uh, in the entire film. And it's the greatest thing that, you know, Tom could hear from Abby. So here we cut to a reaction shot of Tom. This means that there was an entire camera set up where Sasha is off camera. Is that you? <laughs> That's an Oscar. Yes, Eddie owns an Academy Award. <laughs> Oscar winner. It wouldn't be uncommon for either Sasha or, or Eddie to say, can I just get one more? They, they think they can do it better. They think they can do something different. Eddie <laughs> asked for another. We're just getting a reaction shot from him now. This is it. And it takes the entirety of the scene to get this. We don't just roll camera for four seconds uh, and say, you know, Eddie make a face. We do the entire scene, except this time the camera is on Eddie and Sasha is 20 feet uh, uh, behind the camera. By the way, look at that. It's the, uh, it's the face of a little boy who realizes that his brother loves him. Very well drawn there. This is the relationship of two brothers. I didn't know that when we started shooting the movie. And Eddie Redmayne said to me before we did the scene, he goes, yeah, this is where, you know, the two brothers are fighting. I go, what brothers? He goes, Abby and Tom, you know, Aaron always said, this is a movie about the relationship between two brothers, right? This is sibling rivalry. And I go, when did he tell you that? He goes, you know, from the beginning, the day he hired me. I go, Aaron never told me that. I just forgot, I swear to God, I just forgot. I didn't ask what you thought of the man, I asked what you thought of his instruction of the crowd. I've also heard Tom Hayden say, let's end the war, but nobody stopped shooting. The way um, I learned the accent, I would write it out the way it sounded, essentially. So war was W-A-H dash U-H. Let's end the war. One of the things he sacrificed with uh, a, a tight budget is rehearsal time. But by the time we got here, we had shot a lot in the courtroom and people simply knew how to do it. You start with the master. The master is the widest, longest possible shot you can do uh, of the scene. Once you get in the editing room, you're hardly ever going to be uh, in the master. In fact, I haven't been able to find a moment in this scene when we were in the master. And then you're slowly moving in closer and closer so that by the time we're doing the setups that are going to count, they have done it 40 times. Do you have contempt? He just seen his best friend get hit in the head with a nightstick. The police, Mr. Schultz. There, right there. Another setup, a whole another time, uh, several times that Sasha is doing the scene, but not on camera. We're going for this three shot. I'm sure that there's coverage of all seven. I'm sure there's coverage of the two lawyers. In other words, a lot of the shooting day is spent on coverage. I know that this feels like a scene that's just between Sasha and uh, and Joe, but you have to include everybody. You have to include the defendants and the lawyers, both the prosecution and the defense. You have to include the jury and the judge, and you have to include everyone sitting in the gallery. It takes hours and hours of film to create a five minute scene. Do you have contempt for your government? Do I? Yeah, do you have contempt for your government. I think the institutions of our democracy are wonderful things that right now are populated by some terrible people. That line, was that written? Yes, that's the thing. That line was written before Donald Trump. Really? Never did I make a change in the script to be, be as a reaction to something that was going on in the world. That was the only line I was tempted to take out just because it sounded so much uh, like I had written it as a reaction to Donald Trump and the whole MAGA uh, gang. But then I just said, stick to your guns. I was thinking about Donald Trump when I delivered that. Do you have contempt for your government? I'll tell you, Mr. Schultz, it's nothing compared to the contempt my government has for me. It's one of my favorite moments in the film right there. We've heard testimony from 27 witnesses under oath that say you hoped for a confrontation with the police, that your plans for the convention were designed specifically to draw the police into a confrontation. Well, if I'd known it was gonna be the first wish of mine that came true, I would have aimed a lot higher. Ken, these glasses were put on in post. They were not. 
<laughs> there was a feeling that Joseph Gordon-Levitt was not commanding enough and looked too young and boyish. Glasses were put on by three-time Oscar winner Rob Legato in post. Joseph Gordon-Levitt comes to play every day. If you look at the reflection here, you'll see one of the Ewoks from Star Wars because that they had to steal the glasses. Sasha is making that up. <laughs> Eddie Redmayne is CGI here. I actually, circle Alex Sharp for a second. You, you can't really see it in this. We'd have to get closer. My only concern about casting Alex was that I thought if you put Joseph Gordon-Levitt in a time machine and sent him back 10 years, he would look exactly like Alex Sharp. It's a yes or no question. When you came to Chicago, were you hoping for a confrontation with the police? I'm concerned you have to think about it. Give me a moment, would you, friend? I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. Six different camera setups in the last 15 seconds of that scene. And I would say there are about a hundred ways to play that moment badly. Sasha didn't, you know, avoided all of them by just not pressing, by keeping it simple. And when I say simple, I mean simple, but I also mean honest. It's a wonderful experience on set and you completely trust Aaron as a director when he says, you've got the scene because you know if you've pleased Aaron Sorkin, you've done a great job. What a nice thing to say. Yeah, I just read it, it was on the prompter right next to me. Okay. <laughs>